welcome to the 38th lecture in our particle characterization course. In the last few lectures, we have been looking at some uh, real world as well as industrial applications where particle characteristics and characterization are very important. In the last lecture, we discussed various aspects of um, ignition and explosion involving solid particles as well as liquid droplets and we discussed various uh, parameters that are of importance in determining the rates and the um, viability of these processes. Today we are going to look at some more consequences of particles that we encounter in everyday life and again examine specifically which characteristics of particles affect these phenomena. In particular, we are going to look at um, human health and um, environmental aspects. Now, as we know, the atmosphere around us is loaded with all kinds of chemicals and also with particles. Dust is probably the most common particulate constituent of the environment that we live in, but there are also more specific sources of particles that are generated from industries or from automobiles or just from various things that we do as part of our everyday life. So these um, particles are constantly floating around us. So obviously there is an inter interaction, an interface between us and the particles that are suspended in air around us. Now if you look at how the human body receives particles from the outside, there are really three major mechanisms by which it happens. One is simple swallowing or ingestion. The second is inhalation. The particles enter through our noses. And the third way, which is applicable for very, very fine particles, is through penetrating our skin. If particles that are nanodimensional in size can easily penetrate um, our skin and enter our body that way. Now, if you look at these different mechanisms by which particles can enter us, um, there is clearly a relationship to particle size, shape, and density. Uh, for example, particles that we inhale come from a general population of particles that are around us. And the range of particle sizes can vary from 0 0.00 0 something microns all the way up to large microns and millimeter sizes. Now, in terms of particles that are inhaled and then exhaled, these particles tend to be in a much um, narrower size range. Particles that are in the 0.1 micron to 1 micron size range are easily exhaled by the body. So they don't stay inside the body. And the reason for that is because as we have seen in earlier lectures, particles in that size range are the most difficult to capture. Their transport properties are such that they cannot be easily retained by any filtration mechanism or by adhesion to surfaces. So even though we may be ingesting many of these particles into our system, they are also easily expelled from our body. So they don't really cause harmful consequences. But if you look at the very heavy particles or large particles, they are mostly retained by of course our, you know, the mucous membrane in our nostrils. And so they don't really enter our body through our breathing system. However, these larger particles can easily be swallowed. So they can enter the human body through the digestive system. Uh, and they can be retained by the human body, which means that they can cause acute as well as chronic effects. An acute effect is one which is intense but occurs over a short period of time. Chronic is essentially a long-term condition which can actually lead to fatalities in some cases. And so these large particles that are swallowed have the potential to cause such harmful effects. And then you have the very fine particles that are smaller than 0.1 microns. Now again, if you look at our lungs and even our digestive systems, the pathways are very tortuous. Um, you know, huge lengths of um, the passage is compressed within a short area. So you can imagine that uh, there is a lot of essentially tortuosity in our, in our systems, which means that it's actually very unlikely that a particle can make it all the way through and, for example, end up at the bottom of our lungs. 
but the particle that can do that is the very very fine particle. A nanometer sized particle has sufficient diffusivity that it can actually penetrate all the way through this tortuosity and end up in our lungs. So very very fine particles can also cause acute and chronic effects because of their diffusive tendencies. Of course once they get into our lung and deposit in the lung you know that that has very severe harmful consequences. Basically what happens to smokers, smokers are con constantly ingesting particles, very fine particles in cigarette smoke and depositing them in their lungs and that eventually leads to lung cancer and so on. And so um, the particle size clearly plays a huge role in whether the human body accepts the particle or rejects the particle. Now shape also plays a significant role because a spherical particle is more likely to be exhaled compared to a non-spherical particle. Uh, a fibrous particle has the maximum probability of retention by the human body. And so that is why fibers are considered especially dangerous if they can be um, either breathed in or even swallowed, okay. Density also plays a role because you know if a particle is very dense, very heavy, the probability that it can actually settle in one of the chambers in our body is rather large. And of course other properties like uh, solubility plays a role because uh, a particle that is insoluble in saliva, in the human blood and so on has a better chance of being again expelled from the body without causing harmful consequences. Whereas a particle or any foreign body that can dissolve in our bodily fluids obviously has much greater potential for causing harm just as you know if it's a medicinal particle it can cause good because of its dissolution properties. A harmful particle because of its dissolution properties will cause more damage to the human body than a particle that's not soluble. So the, the physical properties as well as the chemical properties the composition of the particle also plays a major role in terms of how these atmospheric particles interact with the human body. Now if you look at how are the, are the effects of these particles on the human system, um, there are really a few classifications that you can offer. There is a, a phenomenon called fibrosis. Fibrosis is associated with primarily ingestion of fibrous particles. A classic example is silicosis which happens because of ingestion of silicon oxide particles. Um, another example is asbestos, you know the reason that you are discouraged from having asbestos roofing is because the asbestos fibers that can be shed by uh, asbestos surfaces if injected into the human system can become toxic to the system. Um, another example is beryllium, beryllium fibers are generated wherever beryllium materials are being machined or processed and beryllium fibers also have very high uh, toxicity effects. So these are examples of particles which are particularly dangerous because of their shape. Now an asbestos particle if you just swallow it probably won't cause you much damage. It's the asbestos that you breathe in that causes damage to the human system. And the main reason is the shape. Because of the fibrous shape, particles, these asbestos fibers tend to get retained in our lungs and eventually they lead to um, carcinogenic effects uh, of the human body. The other type of interaction that these foreign particles can have with the human system is toxic effects. Now that's where the chemical nature of the particle becomes important. I mean we are constantly swallowing particles right, I mean as I am speaking I am probably swallowing hundreds of particles into my system. Luckily not too many of them are cancerous or toxic so I survive. But if you happen to be in an envi environment where there are many toxic particles floating around you know you won't be so lucky. For example lead poisoning is a case where the particle that you swallow lead does have toxic effects and it can cause you. Um, harm. Um, another example is cadmium, particularly cadmium oxide, extremely toxic. So if you happen to be in a location where cadmium is being processed, you better make sure that you are wearing masks and other things to prevent these particles from entering your system. 
Um, another example would be uh, radioactive material. You know, if you are, in fact, there is a story that in the old days, you know, watches used to have radium, right, for uh, being able to read the time at night. Um, the problem is the radium itself was applied with brushes, so the operators were not coming in contact. However, they used to lick the brushes before they applied the radium. And many of these uh, workers in watch factories over time started showing symptoms of cancer. That is because of the radioactive particles that were entering their body through this act of licking the brush to get, um, actually to get more uniform application of radium on the dial. Um, so these are some examples of toxic particles. They may have the same size, shape, density characteristics as a dust particle, but they are clearly much more harmful because of the nature of the particle. So we've talked about fibrosis, we talked about toxicity. The third kind of effect that environmental particles can have on humans is just irritants. You know, we all sneeze, right? Sneezing is caused by an allergic reaction. So things like uh, pollen can cause allergic reactions or just dust, household dust. If you go into an environment where it hasn't been cleaned for a long time, the dust accumulation can cause you to sneeze. And uh, certainly many people suffer from pollen allergies. And interestingly in Chennai, because the weather is so humid, we don't really have to deal with allergic problems because the particles that are uh, emitted, for example, by plants, <clears throat> um, actually because of the humidity, they quickly agglomerate and just settle. And that's the reason that people don't suffer too much from allergies when they come to Chennai. The same person who goes to say Bangalore or goes to a foreign country um, will immediately suffer severe allergic reactions because the humidity there is much lower. So there is no tendency for particles to get wet and settle down. And so these, um, these irritants, again, can cause both chronic effects as well as acute effects. Um, an acute effect is just discomfort, sneezing. A chronic effect, you know, is things like um, you can develop asthma, right, if you have severe allergy type of conditions. So the effects are, are there. I mean, there, there are many harmful effects due to particles that are present in our system. The intensity of the effect depends a lot, again, on the nature of the particle and also on the person. Some people are more prone to allergic reactions than others. So that also um, comes into play. Um, another example is, um, you know, in, in cotton mills. Um, people that, uh, that work for long times in cotton mills develop severe allergic reactions. And this is due to essentially cotton lint that's present. Many people develop a, an adverse reaction to that. So the science of dealing with particles in the atmosphere from the viewpoint of their interaction with the human body is clearly very different from other applications that we have talked about. Now, other thing to keep in mind is, I said that the third way in which particles can enter the human body is through the skin. Um, and that is the reason why, actually, if you compare the effects of an atom bomb versus nerve gas, uh, which do you think is more harmful to humans? It's actually the nerve gas because the human body can actually screen out radioactive emissions because these tend to be larger particles. But nerve gas can easily penetrate through your skin and it can affect your nerves, it can affect your tissues. And that is why, you know, the use of nerve gas in battles is prohibited around the world because it can have a very, very immediate and highly debilitating effect on anybody that comes in contact with, uh, with gas. Again, the reason is that your skin porosities are of the order of nanometers. So it's very difficult for particles that are larger than the nanometer dimension to penetrate through the skin, whereas gases, obviously, because the molecules are much smaller, can easily diffuse through the skin. So here is a case where the transport characteristics of a particle actually prevents it from becoming harmful to the human body because it's not able to diffuse through the pores that are present in our skin. Um, so these are some immediate health and hygiene effects that humans can suffer from due to particles. But if you look at the environment itself, you know, we have all <coughs> read about global warming and before that ozone depletion was a big issue. Um, and, and 
the, the cause behind all this is obviously pollutants that are present in the atmosphere. Um, the ozone problem, the ozone depletion problem was basically happening because of emission of chlorophore fluorocarbon molecules, CFCs to the atmosphere. Global warming on the other hand is a much more complicated problem and it is not clear whether the presence of particles helps or hurts in the context of global warming. You know, essentially global warming happens because the heat that is incident on the ground is not able to reflect back into the stratosphere. So it's trapped close to the uh, Earth's surface and, and results in a gradual increase of surface temperatures. Now what role can a particle play in this? Um, so if you look at pollution in general, there's two kinds. One is what we call industrial pollution. Many of the industries that are operating emit contaminants to the environment. But actually industrial pollutants are, are in, in a way easier to deal with because you can actually find the source. You know, if you capture the pollutant, analyze its composition, you can pretty much tell which industry it came from. Um, and, and so you can trace, trace it back to the source, you can put in containment measures, so you can control it fairly effectively. But the other kind of uh, environmental pollution is just smog. You know, smog is smoke plus fog. And this is contributed by virtually everything that happens on planet Earth, you know, automobiles, um, people doing things, cooking, whatever you do, um, you are contributing to the atmosphere. Um, so this is, it's, it's very difficult in this case to pinpoint the sources. You have to essentially um, ascribe many, many different sources essentially contributing cumulatively to the population of particles that you find in the, in the environment. Now, in this case, um, the role that particles play is um, actually quite subtle. Um, particles themselves are a pollutant, obviously. And as we have seen, depending on what the nature of the particle is, it can cause direct harm to humans or not. It may be a benign particle or it may be a, a harmful particle. But particles also play a secondary role in terms of serving as condensation nuclei. So when, when very fine particles are present in the environment, if there is a vapor that's also present in the environment, the vapor may have stayed as vapor in the absence of the particle. But in the presence of the particle, heterogeneous nucleation happens and you actually form a condensed phase. Now, in some cases that's good, in some cases that's not. In one of the previous lectures, we talked about how rain happens. Rain happens because water vapor that is present in the environment finds these fine particles on which it forms a condensate. And this heterogeneous nucleation process gives rise to what are known as condensation nuclei and it uh, promotes the formation of water droplets. So in that sense, it's a good thing to happen. But on the other hand, for example, there are many sulfur emissions, again, from automobiles, from factories. Now, if the sulfur stayed in the atmosphere as sulfur trioxide or sulfur dioxide gas, it probably won't give harm us too much. But what we see happening is what's known as acid rain, right? The sulfur in SO2 and SO3 gets converted to sulfuric acid liquid, which then essentially rains back down upon the earth and causes many harmful consequences. So how does acid rain happen? How does SO2 gas get converted to H2SO4 liquid? Here, particles actually play a major role. They play the role of a catalyst. They provide the surface on which the SO2 particles can interact with H2O molecules. I mean, the SO2 vapors interact with H2O vapors to form H2SO4 as a liquid condensate on the surface. Now, there are two ways in, in which it can happen. The SO2 molecules can react with H2O in the vapor phase, form H2SO4 vapor. That H2SO4 vapor can then condense on the surface of the particle to form H2SO4 liquid. That's one mechanism. The other mechanism is where the H2O vapor and the SO2, SO3 vapor come together on the surface of the particle and form the H2SO4 liquid. So in one case, you would call it a physical vapor deposition process. In the other case, you would call it a 
chemical vapor deposition process, but the net result in both cases is a formation of a thin layer of um, the liquid um, on the surface of the particle. Um, now, if you look at how this happens, um, again, there are two possible mechanisms. One is simple physical adsorption, and the other is chemical adsorption or chemical reaction that causes the formation of this uh, liquid film. Um, so, physisorption is basically what happens when you have a particle and you start forming these H2SO4 vapor molecules in the atmosphere and eventually these molecules attach themselves to the surface of the particle, right. This is a physisorption process. The other process is, as I was mentioning, you have H2O molecules and SO2, SO3 molecules coming together on the surface to form H2SO4 liquid on the surface. And this is a chemisorption process because the reaction to convert the vapor species to the condensed phase happens on the surface. You can also look at this as a homogeneous nucleation process and you can look at this as a heterogeneous nucleation process. If you look at the kinetics of these two processes and try to figure out which one is more likely to happen, um, physisorption is essentially a physical adsorption process. So it depends on um, how many molecules are actually approaching the surface and what time they spend in contact with the surface. And so you can look at the number of um, molecules that are adsorbed of any species I by physical sorption as being equal to N um, impinging of the same species I times a, a time, let's call that tau. So this is actually, um, this is a flux of species uh, that is approaching the surface. Let's use a different notation just to clarify. Let's call this some J. So this is a flux of material that's impinging on the surface of the particle. Tau is the time of contact. between the vapor, between the vapor and the particle surface. So J times tau gives you the number of molecules that are adsorbing per unit area of the particle surface. Now this tau can be written as some tau zero times exponential E by RT where E is your heat of adsorption. You can also look at it as a latent heat of condensation of the molecules on the surface and T is temperature. So as temperature increases, the time that is available for adsorption to happen decreases. So that is the reason as, as the environment gets hotter, there's actually less potential for rain to happen. As the temperature gets lower, the probability of rain increases. Similarly for acid rain also, or for the formation of a H2SO4 liquid on the surface of these particles, the probability of that layer formation increases as temperature drops. Now this tau zero is actually of the order of 10 to the power minus 12 to 10 to the power minus 14 seconds. That's a very, very short time. So the time that these molecules spend in contact with any particle in the atmosphere is very small. So what does that mean? It means that the likelihood of one vapor molecule of H2SO4 attaching itself to a particle surface and turning into a liquid is uh, this, this value of N adsorption is approximately equal to one per particle. So if you only relied on physical adsorption to form this condensed layer, you will only have about one molecule of it 
it happening over a fairly extended period of time. Now if you look at a 1 nanometer sized particle to cover the entire circumference of the 1 nanometer sized particle with a monolayer of liquid will take at least about 40 to 50 molecules. So clearly with this process when you have, when you have, the probability is that you will only get one molecule to attach, it's unlikely that you are going to get 40 or 50 molecules to attach to a particle and form a condensed layer. So physical adsorption is not a promising mechanism for converting SO2 and SO3 vapors to H2SO4. So the more likely mechanism by which you have acid rain happening is a chemical conversion of the kind that you know, we have outlined here. And it turns out that the um, probability of this kind of uh, heterogeneous nucleation of a condensed layer on the outside of a particle is much higher. There is a parameter called uh, reactive uptake coefficient. which dictates essentially what fraction of incident molecules will get attached to a surface. And this is about 10 to the power minus 2 to 10 to the power minus 3 for H2SO4 liquid by um, heterogeneous nucleation. So in terms of probability, this mechanism is much more likely to, to result in the formation of a liquid layer around a particle compared to the other mechanism. And in fact, in this case, the rate of formation of the H2SO4 liquid or rate of adsorption by particle in terms of volumes, volume per second is given by 1 by 4 times C times A particle times this value gamma where C is the approach velocity of the vapor. AP is the area of the particle, pi dp squared by 4 if you assume a spherical particle and gamma is then the reactive uptake coefficient. So if you substitute numbers here, um, it turns out that the rate of formation of a molten layer or condensed layer on the external of the particles is much higher and more in line with what we see in practice. So again, the, the point here is that um, the presence of particles in the atmosphere plays a direct role in terms of affecting us in, in many ways, but also plays a very key indirect role in terms of converting vapors into condensed phases. This process is unlikely to happen from an energetics viewpoint in the absence of particles, but in the presence of particles, it's very easy. So again, that has good consequences in terms of promoting rain but it has bad consequences in terms of promoting formation of harmful condensed materials like um, H2SO4 and so on. Now if you look at this process more closely, um, you know when you have a particle and you have vapors approaching the particle and getting converted to a condensed liquid, um, there are actually several resistances in series, right? So this, this, if you look at the total resistance, and you write it as 1 over resistance total. This will be equal to 1 over the resistance to diffusion plus 1 over resistance to reaction plus 1 over resistance to accommodation. So first, the species 
um, well even before that there is even a resistance to convection. The species have to be brought by airflow to the vicinity of the particle. So there is a resistance associated with that. Secondly, the, the, the vapors then have to diffuse through a boundary layer to reach the surface of the particles and there is a resistance associated with that. Once they reach the surface of the particle, the vapors have to find each other and react and there are some kinetic factors involved. So there is a resistance to this reaction taking place. And finally, there is a resistance to accommodation of the product. The particle has to be able to hold the product that forms and there is a resistance to that because the droplet may want to dissociate from the surface and become re-entrained in the gas phase. So in terms of the reactive uptake coefficients, you can again um, write the overall 1 over gamma as 1 over gamma convection plus 1 over gamma diffusion plus 1 over gamma reaction plus 1 over gamma accommodation. So in order for the ultimately the droplet or the condensate to happen on the surface all these resistances have to be overcome in series. Now this is essentially for a dry particle that comes in contact with vapors. Um, even though this type of heterogeneous nucleation increases the, prob the likelihood of formation of a condensed phase, the probability is still relatively low. It's, it's higher than what was predicted just due to physics option, but it is still fairly low. So what happens to increase the probability even further? If the particle is moist to begin with. In other words, if the particle itself has a layer of water surrounding it in a condensed phase, then the, H, the SO2 or SO3 molecules can very easily react with the water that's present and get converted to H2SO4. So the presence of a, a water layer on the outside of the particles promotes the formation of H2SO4. Now here again it's kind of a good news bad news story. The fact that you can get water to condense on the outside of the particles suggests that you know rain is likely. But on the other hand as soon as you start forming these essentially condensation nuclei it also promotes the formation of acids and so on which are actually harmful. And so in, in environments and conditions that are uh, conducive to rain it's also conducive to acid rain. So that's the, 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 the problem you have to deal with. And uh, so any efforts that you make to promote rainfall, for example, which is considered a good thing to do, always keep in mind there can be adverse consequences as well because raindrops are also effective getters of harmful chemicals from the atmosphere. Just like harmful vapors can condense on solid particles, they can also very easily condense on the liquid droplets or be absorbed by the liquid droplets. And so um, the rain that comes down may not be very pure. In fact, if you sample rainfall anywhere in near a major city like Chennai, it's not clean, right? I mean, you cannot take rainwater and drink it directly. You have to filter it, you have to purify it. Whereas the same rainwater that you collect in the you know, Amazons or you know, somewhere would be much purer. And in that case, because the pollutants are not there in the atmosphere. So rain is an effective getterer for all kinds of harmful impurities that are, that are present in the environment. So that, that has to be um, taken into account as well. Um, so this, this problem of reactive uptake is one that uh, is something that has been very, uh, very well modeled and Certainly there's a lot of good understanding about the kinetics of this whole process. How does rain form? How does acid rain form? And so all these efforts to actually seed clouds in order to bring about rainfall are actually based on a good understanding of how these mechanisms work. How does homogeneous nucleation happen? How does heterogeneous nucleation happen? What is the critical size of a particle that can initiate 
condensation. So when they do this seeding of uh, rain clouds, essentially what they are doing is shooting an aerosol with very, very fine particles in it. The sizes of these particles are controlled in a way to promote this type of nucleation, heterogeneous nucleation to happen. So essentially by shooting this aerosol through a cloud, you can convert water vapors into water droplets. You know, that's basically how um, artificial rainfall works. And um, so the, I mean the, the science behind this is reasonably clear. Now it can get complicated when you start looking at multi-component situations. Uh, when you have many different species that are competing for accommodation on a surface, the adsorption of one species can lead to desorption of another species. And you will have, again, competition for space in terms of which species gets preferentially adsorbed on the surface and leads to the formation of a, a liquid phase and so on. Uh, but these are some interesting examples of particulate applications in environmental chemistry and environmental physics that we should be aware of. Um, of course, the effect of the particles in the atmosphere, um, again, it can lead to things like people suffering allergies and asthma and so on, but also more practical consequences like loss of visibility, right? When there's a smog, you cannot see. So planes cannot take off. And the reason for that is, of course, the ability of particles to obscure light transmission. So the net effect of particles present in the atmosphere is uh, something where the different characteristics of the particles have different effects. So the simple uh, interaction of the particle suspensions with light can have huge consequences in terms of, again, delaying flights, making it difficult for people to drive on the road, just making it difficult for people to see. Uh, whereas the chemical aspects of the particles can lead to much more direct as well as indirect effects on uh, human health and um, you know, damage to soil, degradation in quality of water streams and, and all that stuff. Now another interesting aspect of particulate behavior in the environment is um, you know, dust clouds. As I mentioned earlier, the primary particulate contaminant in the environment is dirt or dust. But how does the dust come to be in the environment? Because dust actually has good uh, significant mass, right? It has a tendency to settle. So if you just leave uh, dust in an environment like this, eventually it will settle down. And all the large particles will sediment and, and, be, and deposit on the floor. But we see that in, in many places, especially near deserts, the level of dust in the environment remains constant. So how does that happen? Well, dust is generated simply because of movement of airflow across a surface containing loose particles of sand. So obviously in a, in a, in a desert you have sandstorms because there is so much loose sand that can be easily airborne and be transported over uh, long distances. Whereas in, in a place like Chennai, once again, the humidity has a role of getting the dust particles to settle quickly. So we don't see buildup of dust storms. You may have read in the paper that in, in Delhi, they had a major sandstorm last night, right? It happens because Delhi is relatively dry at this time of the year. So any sand that gets blown in or gets entrained uh, stays in the environment for a long period of time. Um, if you look at the uh, concentration of dust particles in the environment, it turns out that it is very much related to uh, two parameters. One is the mean size of particles that are present in the sand at that location, and the second is the velocity of airflow in that location. And the reason that these two parameters are, are most important is because, I mean, the particle size plays a huge role in determining uh, whether it will follow the airflow or not. I mean, essentially the finer the sand particles, the more likely that it will become airborne when you have wind blowing across the sandy layer and it will stay in the environment for a long period of time. Whereas if the particles are coarse, then there is a greater probability that it will not follow the streamlines, will not get airborne so easily and therefore the settling characteristics will be much faster in terms of coarse sand compared to fine sand. And that is the other reason why uh, when you look at places like deserts, 
where the sand particles have been essentially polished over many, many years, the distribution of particle size in sand in a, in a desert region tends to be much smaller compared to the distribution of size you will find in you know dirt in a city like Chennai. And that is the reason why uh, dust storms are so much more intense over dry regions like, uh, like deserts compared to more humid regions and more coastal regions like, um, like we have in, in India for the most part. Um, and, the, and the reason that, and by the way the velocity effect is not a direct effect of velocity, it is actually the, the velocity gradient that, ha that plays a huge role. If you have wind for example blowing on a sandy surface and the velocities are reasonably uniform everywhere, then the uh, effect of entraining particles is much less severe compared to if you have steep velocity gradients. And the reason for that is when you have a steep velocity gradient, it is easy for particles that are picked up at one location to essentially become stagnant in that location. You essentially set up these recirculation type of flows and that is really what leads to higher levels of steady state concentration of sand particles in the atmosphere. Whereas if you have essentially uniform velocity convective flow, the particles will not stay around in one place for very long. So um, you do not really have to deal with particles in a static mode. I mean they are more dynamic in their nature, again less likely to cause harm and, and other um, effects. And so um, again uh, the modeling of movement of sand in the environment has been extensively done. There are very good CFD models that can essentially predict how dust will behave in, in an environment. And clearly its effect in a built up environment will be very different from the effect in a uh, unbuilt up environment. Um, in a city, you know particles cannot travel very far without encountering an obstruction to their movement. And so they have a tendency to either settle on a <coughs> building surface or on a road surface and so on. Whereas if you are in a desert, uh, again there is nothing for the particles to attach to and deposit. So without adhesion being present as a mechanism to remove particles from the gas stream, they tend to stay around in the, in the environment for much longer. So the transport characteristics and the long term uh, sustainability of uh, dust in atmosphere very much depends on the flow environment and what surfaces come in contact with these, uh, these dust particles. So the, the movement of sand and, and, and dirt or dust due to airflow is another example of particulate behavior in real life which if you want to properly understand and characterize it, you do need to be aware of particularly the transport properties of particles and how they are affected by the various physical um, features of the particle. Okay, so we will stop at this point and then in the next lecture we will deal with a couple of more examples of particles that we encounter in various applications and how their characteristics affect their behavior. Uh, any question? Okay, see you at the next lecture.